Hello and welcome to episode 15 of the Indie by Design podcast, the show about games and the people who make them. In each weekly episode we sit down with interesting people to talk about them, their work and their outlook on games. The Indie by Design podcast is brought to you by Stace Harmon and John Robertson. You can reach us on social media and on YouTube by searching Indie by Design on those platforms. And you can visit us at IndieByDesign.net where you'll find more episodes of the podcast and our book, Independent by Design, Art and Stories of Indie Game Creation, for perusal and purchase. Check us out on Patreon.com Indie by Design where you can join our growing number of Patreon backers helping to support and improve our podcast and getting more people talking about games. Pledging is super easy and every contribution is very much appreciated. Amongst the Patreon rewards is additional podcast content and whole Patreon-only episodes to boot, so please do check us out at patreon.com slash indiebydesign. This episode of the podcast is hosted by me, Stace Harmon, and features Alex Thomas, co-founder of development studio Stoic, who are responsible for the wonderful Banner Saga series of games. Alex has also released stealthy heist management title, Killers and Thieves, which he developed alone and published through Stoic. Here, Alex gives a raw account of his time developing Killers and Thieves, offering an honest assessment of his own successes and failures throughout the project, and highlighting what he believes have been the downsides of a low-key launch. There's also a discussion of why Alex avoided early access for Killers and Thieves, but why he believes it could absolutely be the right way to go for a future release, the pressures of delivering on a successful Kickstarter campaign, and his time writing the currently in-development Banner Saga 3. We start this week's episode with talk about the formation of Stoic, the company Alex co-founded alongside John Watson and Arnie Jorgensen, whom he worked with at Bioware on Star Wars The Old Republic. Here's Alex talking about how collaboration on a side project while he and Arnie were still at Bioware came about for what was then the newly released Apple iPad. Usually game companies are pretty protective about what they let you collaborate on while you're working for them, Mm. you know, outside projects. Um... But the the iPad had just come out. Now this does sound like it was a million years ago. <laughs> uh, what, there was the a first... time before the iPad? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I know. I, I'm constantly telling my daughter, like, <laughs> we didn't even have the Internet. She's never impressed. No. She probably uh, doesn't believe you. It's just that. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't even imagine. Uh, but the first I had, iPad had just come out, and it and it was blowing everyone away. And uh, there are all these like interactive kids books, mm. which were pretty darn impressive at the time. And that was something that we could do um, because it wasn't competing in the industry. Uh, so we got permission to do a, a children's book on the iPad, uh, and me and Arnie made something called Dino Boy, mm-hmm. and it's just this little like choose your own adventure for kids. And it's cute. Um, and we didn't make, make any money on it, but we uh, we found that we worked really well together. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, the the next obvious step, of course, after making a children's book, is to quit your <laughs> job and start a game company. Uh, it was one of those, you know, we either do it now mm-hmm. or we never do it kind mm-hmm. of situations. It kind of, it seems like like one extreme. To the other, though. I mean, I guess did the did what was the internal process like when you're presenting something like that and you're saying this is what we want to work on? And I guess the the, the big wigs at Bioware or, or you know in general, like you say, general development studios have various issue, uh, various um, various guidelines of, of to what you can and can't work on in your own time. So, do you have to kind of outline it fully to show your employer that this is what we're working on and this is how it's not going to compete in any way whatsoever with what we do? as our as our day job like or is it just fairly casual uh well it's pretty it's pretty explicitly clear that you cannot work on another game okay so the only way that we were <clears throat> able to do that was by you know straight up quitting our jobs mm. Mm. um i started doing some contract work for another company so that i could i would have more time to work on uh developing the banner saga um Arnie couldn't work on any of it until we had enough to, uh, basically for our Kickstarter pitch. Mm. And then he quit, you know, he left his job and, and we, uh, ended up spending another three months just making the Kickstarter pitch. Mm. So it was definitely a, uh, you know, a risky move. I think a lot of people 
it was kind of, it was like right on the edge of a whole bunch of people doing the same thing as us, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, because before that, the only way you could get funding was through another publisher. Yeah. There was no such thing as like independent development on anything bigger than a one person team, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, that's something that um, I know has been echoed by, uh, which was around the same sort of time as you guys, I think, with uh, Double Fine and their mm -hmm. record-breaking Broken Age Kickstarter. And having watched some of the, kind of read the the, the Kickstarter pitches and watched some of the um, video updates that you guys did for that and, and that Tim Schafer did for, for their one, the, you can kind of see some similarities. And I know that you talked about it afterwards, like or perhaps not afterwards, but I think it's towards the end of the campaign you put out a video in which you talked about kind of how it felt like this was a real watershed moment, like a change of, not that the old way would go out the window of making games, but that this was perhaps a watershed moment of how games could now be made going forward. And, and that's something, again, that Tim Schafer kind of talked about as well. And that, like, was there a feeling of kind of people voting for for some for for change like voting for something that they wanted to see happen more than just yeah this game looks cool there's my 20 or 30 dollars oh yeah absolutely uh you know i think we were incredibly lucky with the timing we were working on our pitch when the double fine thing came out mm. so we're right in the middle of coming up with a kickstarter pitch and before double fine came out it was very grassroots. Everything was really amateur hour on mm. Kickstarter. And the most you could ask for and hope to get was like 70,000. Mm -hmm. You know, when we looked across all the projects, that was, that was the most anybody had made. Mm. Um, and then Double Fine came out and they had high production value video that was funny and blew everyone away. And we were like, oh crap, now we gotta like, <laughs> we gotta completely step up our game on this or we're going to look like scrubs. But we, we absolutely rode the the wave that they made. And, uh, you know, I think there are, I think there's a lot of people that were interested in the project and I think we did a good job with the campaign. Mm. But I also know that we got really lucky with the timing and a lot of people were there just to see, you know, is this going to become a, a big thing? Mm. You know, they want to watch it um, when Banner's Tonga finally did come out, it got more critical reviews than some of the games that year, like Call of Duty, you know? <laughs> and it was just because of that huge interest in did Kickstarter do something, you know, mm. change something. Yeah. My writing partner and I uh, did a Kickstarter as well, not anywhere near uh, as successful as, as you guys were, or, or of course Double Fines either, but it was like, it was 110% funded, it, it did what it needed to yeah. do, which was awesome. Um, but it is an all-consuming process, and it is something that, you know, you do work on, it becomes like a full-time job just to 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 fulfil that, that thing. And we naively thought we would do the work before before time, put the Kickstarter live, and that that would be it. It would run itself, which was just foolishness. It was that was utter nonsense. It doesn't work like that. But was it? Were you guys kind of really like neck deep in it every day? And and were, were, did you kind of live it for that? Were you living in a bubble, a kind of kickstarted bubble for that month that you were running your your campaign? Oh yeah, exactly like you said. I mean, this was like uncharted territory. Mm. Um, Nobody had any experience to tell you beforehand, hey, you're going to be doing this 24 hours a day for the next 30 days. Mm. Uh, but it absolutely is true. You, like launching the game isn't, I mean, launching the Kickstarter campaign isn't the end of your work. It, it's the beginning. Yeah. At least, you know, at least if you're, if you're um, getting a lot of interest, mm. that's the case. And I get, well, even if you're not, I guess, because then you're working twice as hard just to try and make up the ground that you feel that you need as well, I guess. So it's, yeah, that's uh, probably true. <clears throat> yeah, we, I mean, we, we've spoken to people, we spoke to the guys at Subset Games who made FTL and mm -hmm. uh, at Messhoff as well, um, who made Nidhogg, but Mark Essen put a Kickstarter up for Flywrench. Um, and though in those cases, like the, the amounts that you were talking about then, I think the FTL... Kickstarter was for ten thousand dollars. The Fry right. Wrench one was for five thousand um, dollars, and yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, obviously, F two L was a bit of an anomaly itself because that went that went nuts. But it was, I remember um, uh, Matthew Davis talking about talking about their Kickstarter and, and how, and I don't know if this was this kind of bore out for your own experience, but for him, it became incredibly stressful that the Kickstarter was incredibly successful because he he just wasn't prepared for that kind of reaction and and he talked about wanting almost to to put in place. Um, put in place kind of these these caps to just say that we just need to stop this like we just we can't we don't want any more money we don't know what to do with yeah. it. like it's scary how do you go through that sort of period of adjustment when you ask in your in the case of you guys you know ask for a hundred thousand dollars and you're then with a few days to go you're upwards of five hundred thousand six hundred thousand like how does uh, is it real at that point like how does how do you sort of how do you work that out in your own mind uh, no, it is it is scary. I think you try not to think about what you're going to do with it um, <laughs> uh, until you actually have to, like, sit down with the real amount and mm. uh, start portioning it out. Mm. It's very tempting also, again, with, there is nobody given advice at this point because nobody had gone through it. Um, it's very tempting to make promises, uh, to to keep things going, Mm. Uh, to keep people interested, and that's incredibly dangerous because, you know, you, you would sit there and go, okay, we were planning to do this anyway, so what's the harm in <laughs> promising it as a as a milestone goal or something? Um, but that's not how games are developed because when you're working on a game, uh, as things change, the, the, the decisions that you're making are based on... Uh, what's right for the game at that time, mm. you know? And when it's, when the game's three years away and you're making promises for these big features, uh, like we ended up with some things that, you know, like why, why are we even making this for the game? Like this isn't important to it. You know, we could have been doing something, a, a, a better feature um, or something like the, uh, the, we offer guild crests. Uh, mm-hmm. People could submit their crests and then choose them, and we didn't expect to get so many. Uh, and nobody needs 300 options <laughs> for a guild dress. Uh, and, and implementing that system was a huge uh, drain on our time and resources mm. and not something that actually improved the game, you know? Mm. Uh, mm. And then we ended up having all kinds of problems with people submitting... Um, stolen images and people submitting like copyrighted images and we had to you know sit there and try to sort through them but you know we wouldn't even recognize uh, half of them mm, were, mm. were not legit um, but it also created a huge community you know around this kind of stuff uh, it, it's just a very bewildering process and you, you almost can't predict at all um, what's going to come out of it yeah I mean, I think the, I think it's, I think you're being, you're being very modest. I think when you, when you talk about the interest in the Banner Saga when it released, uh, being kind of very much geared or very much fired by people's curiosity in Kickstarter as a platform, because I think uh, some of that I believe is true, but I think also, you know, Banner Saga itself was a very and is a very it's a, it's quite a unique proposition for the for the manner in which it, it uses the story for the manner in which kind of your 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 game experience plays out through the story and through the battles but mm-hmm. it's the story where all the heavy stuff if you like happens like so you can't you know you can't die in combat but you can certainly die if you try and save a wagon load of supplies from falling off a cliff and then you lose your best warrior or, you know so yeah. there there's definitely i think there's a lot of unique stuff there that people and and just the the art style and the the soundtrack of course and and the dialogue and you know all of that i think really contributed as an entire package to people's enthusiasm for it um and it ended up being incredibly successful which was was awesome uh, and then shortly after that, well, I say shortly after that, you tell me, but from the outside looking in, it seemed that shortly after that, you then made a decision about kind of where you wanted to go next that didn't perhaps tie in with, with what was happening with Stoic and their sort of push towards Banner Saga 2. So can you just kind of talk us through how 
your decision there and, and how that kind of came about and how, how difficult a decision that was for you to make at that point. Sure. Um, well, it's a lot more simple than it probably looked. I mean, we, we didn't really want to go into full detail in public about it and confuse mm-hmm. people for no reason. Uh, but basically, making the Banner Saga 1... Um, just to go back to something you said earlier about getting all this money, now we strongly felt like we had to uh, make a game that um, represented that much money Mm -hmm. uh, instead of the smaller project that we originally intended. Mm -hmm. And we we did end up making something that was huge for three people, and it really was like three people, not including Austin Wintory uh, doing the the music. and it was just an incredibly difficult uh, process to to finish up. Um, lots of crunching and lots of lots of worry, lots of things to deal with constantly coming at you every day. And when we did finally wrap up the first game, I was pretty much experiencing some health problems that were due to uh, overwork and stress. Mm. Um, so. After the game came out, we talked about what we were going to do next. Uh, obviously, the other two guys wanted to go immediately on to the sequel, uh, which makes perfect sense. I mean, there's no reason not to. And uh, pretty much at that point, I just, you know, physically and mentally wasn't able to uh, to start that again right away. Mm. So we decided that, um, you know, I had helped to wrap everything up. I had done all the the pre-production for the second game, uh, mapping out the plot. Um, basically, I decided to sit it out. Um, they wanted to go onto it immediately, and I, I needed a break. Mm. So during that break, you know, it, it, I don't, I'm not going to stop working forever. I start working on this second project, um, and. It's not really like I quit Stoic. Um, it's just, you know, I, I guess when you're an indie team, you can you can just kind of be fluid about it, you know. Mm, kind of drift in and out, I guess, kind of. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, my, you know, stake in the company hadn't changed. You know, my, my relationship with the other two guys working on uh, the Banner Saga hadn't changed. I, I still hang out with them regularly. Mm. Uh it was just the you know meeting the needs of everybody involved. So once I was uh, once I had recovered and was starting to feel uh, more um, you know ready to get back to work, I started working on my own project, uh, which which I developed in parallel with them working on Saga Two. It's one of those kind of moments, I guess. I think Ed McMillan, who who made uh, Super Meat Boy and then kind of needed some downtime after that. And as a, from the way that I understand it, as a kind of a holiday project, he just threw together this thing that went on to become the Binding of Isaac. Um, right. And it yeah. sounds... I hate not... when people do that. It's <laughs> like, I, I threw together this game and um, oh, my next game was also a huge mega hit. <laughs> I just can't help myself. What can I tell yeah. you guys? Sorry. Yeah. Um, but it was... It, so... Like you say, you, like you, you didn't want to just kind of stop working completely, but it sounds like you wanted to just take your foot off the gas a little bit and just put your kind of, I guess, just look after yourself for a bit, rather than kind of just put yourself and your family first, rather than than the game. Um, but you you do yeah. start working on what became Killers and Thieves. Well, I mean, to be completely honest, uh, it it wasn't. I mean, it sounds like I'm I'm making it. I'm. Uh, I'm not going into much detail. It sounds like I just wanted to take a break. The reality was I had I had a deep uh, doctor diagnosed depression, like clinical depression. I was on medication, mm-hmm. and you go, "Why are you depressed? You just launched a game, and everyone loved it." Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. but it was it's just like how you can have asthma induced by exercise, mm-hmm. um, going through long periods of stress. <clears throat> Excuse me, long periods of stress. And, uh, and and overwork can absolutely uh, cause this health issue. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so it was a it was absolutely a period of recovery recovery for me, not just you know hanging out, you yeah. know going going to the pool or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's I I I would imagine that there are probably a lot of people 
in the games industry that I don't imagine you're an isolated case in that sense. I imagine there's a lot oh, of people no. that that happens to, that, and it, and that it doesn't get talked about. And and I don't know. Absolutely, it's a difficult thing, I guess, to explain to people that, like you say, you, right. you just launched this game that's hugely successful. And I don't know, like maybe there's some some people rather callously or unfairly will look at that and say, well, oh, wow, what have you got to be miserable about? As if as if that is all it is, as if kind of depression is just this, oh, you're just a bit glum at the moment. Um, yeah, yeah. I've never felt like I, I, I needed to explain it to the public or that mm. I, I wasn't mm. uh, understood. Um, that, that hasn't really been an issue for me. I, I do legitimately uh, feel like uh, feel bad about not being able to continue on to the second game. Mm. And, uh, for a long time, I thought, you know, I was just done with the Banner Saga. And that, and that did feel pretty terrible because I had, I had created the whole thing, you know? Mm. Mm. I had, uh, created the company and the, the whole idea for the game and the design and the writing. Um, and to just kind of drop it off after it had been, uh, critically, uh, mm you know, appreciated. Um, the the good thing is now uh, going uh, with Banner Saga 3 in production, I've gone back and uh, I'm doing the writing for that. Uh, and that makes me happy because I'm able to do the bookends, you know, the, the first and the yeah. last game and, and, and wrap it up in a really satisfying way for me personally. Uh, yeah, coming back to the Banner Saga 3, is there kind of a feeling of, of that? kind of returning and and i don't know again it was i kind of i was corny earlier but i'm going to say homecoming which is even cornier which is that's just that's worse than journey um but yeah i mean was was there nonetheless however that you know however you i kind of dress it up was was there that has there been that feeling for you with coming back to banner saga 3 as is is it as lead writer is that the is that the official role that you have on banner saga 3 yeah that's right and i would i would absolutely agree i mean like i say it's it's a personal thing for me more than anything that I want to finish this story. Mm. Um, writing the third story is really what I wanted to do from the first, <laughs> the first part of the game because it's where everything is going to come together and really pay off. So I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly glad to be able to do that. I wanted to mention something that you, you said earlier though, uh, about, you know, how incredible it was having this big indie hit as your first project and everything. I think what a lot of people don't see, mm. uh, because maybe when you look at a success like Undertale or Stardew Valley, you think, oh, well, that that's what indie success looks like. Mm-hmm. You, or, or like Stanley Parable, uh, the, de- the developer uh, of which I, I, I know uh, and I've talked to, you think, you know, that's what every every successful indie developer, that's the situation they're in. They made a game... And they sold it by themselves, and now they're like multimillionaires, mm-hmm. and they can do whatever they want. Um, and that's mm-hmm. absolutely not true. Uh, I, I'm trying, I'm trying to figure out how to put this without, without sounding indignant. <laughs> uh, it basically made I've made the same salary as if I had continued working for Bioware. Mm-hmm. And you go like, how is that possible? Because the Banner Saga sold. Uh, I think over a million copies now mm-hmm. between all the different platforms. Um, and it's because you have, you know, a three person owner, mm-hmm. wow. uh, split. You have, a uh, you know, the cost of promotion and advertising and the, the, the guy running mm-hmm. the business, uh, versus, um, you have Steam split. You have, you know, 30% for taxes. Um, you have the the amount of money that has to be put into the next production, and they didn't want to go back to Kickstarter for the Banner Saga two. So all the money that that was spent on that came out of income, you know, and and it just it gets whittled down in such an incredible mm. Mm. fashion that yeah. you know what you don't realize is that these companies probably like and I'm just I'm just guessing, but. The companies with a lot of people like Supergiant or Clay uh, that you look at as these big successes, you know, they're on like maybe successful game three or four now, and and maybe they are doing better. But when their first game came out, 
Um, they weren't overnight millionaires, and, you know, mm -hmm. neither were we, uh, not by a long shot. And I think that's something that people don't see at all. You know, you end up just, mm -hmm. even when you're a master of your own fate, you're still working day-to-day uh, -to -day mm -hmm. and, and hoping that your, your next game will be a success. No, I, I can completely understand that, and, and um, yeah, completely take that on board. I think we kind of we live in a time of headline figures and headline explosive headlines. So even you know you can even take that back to the most basic number that we could talk about here in terms of the Kickstarter, because the seven hundred and twenty-three odd thousand that you raised is not the money that you received, because of course there's dropped backers, there's Kickstarter slice, there's transaction fees, so. Yeah, for sure. Like, I, and and that's just before you've even before you've even got the money that has been pledged. Mm -hmm. a, a chunk of it, however small or large, a chunk of it has been kind of taken out of the the equation. And then, like you say, there's there's all of the the other stuff as well. And I think that's something that, like you mentioned, the promotion and the marketing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, well, you have to people... account for the the biggest uh, uh, piece of the pie was accounting for the physical prizes. You mm. know, yeah. Yes, yeah, and that's, yeah, and I think that, that kind of goes back to something you mentioned in, earlier about the idea of getting kind of carried away, or it, it's easy to get carried away or to promise people things, and it's when you right. sit down to to formulate and conceptualize, conceptualize a, a Kickstarter campaign, you have all these cool ideas about, oh, we could do this, and we could give these amazing physical things, but yes, they then have a manufacture cost associated with them, they have a postage cost mm -hmm. associated with them, but often, I mean, that was certainly the case for us, that was far more than we anticipated, because we had no, we, were, we just estimated it, and it was, you know, it wasn't sufficient, so it's, yeah, I can completely understand that. I, we spoke to um, Introversion Software of uh, Prison Architect. Oh, yeah. And they talked about, for many years, you know, they've been around since 2000, 2001, and they talked about that for many years, success for them meant just being able to carry on doing what they were doing, just being able to scrape by enough to make their next game. Um, oh, yeah, that, I've been following them for a long time, and they've been through a real roller coaster. And that's, yeah, it doesn't, it's not always the whole kind of, uh, like you say, some of those games you mentioned there, it's not always that kind of overnight, well, overnight success means a different thing to, to different people, and, and often, yeah. it's not overnight, often for a start, it's taken a very long time to get to that point, it's just, right. it, it seems like it all blows up at once, but, so, yeah, and I think that's an important distinction to make, I think that's an important point to call out, that it's not, like, you know, the Banner Saga was hugely successful in terms of, of critical acclaim. It was nominated for awards. The fact that it didn't immediately make you guys a whole load of money, the fact that you'd, you'd sort of already made that decision to invest basically all of that Kickstarter money back into the project is is how a game like that gets made in the first place. Because if you decided not to do that, if you decided you were going to take a nice big chunk of that for yourselves and kind of still make that game that you were originally planned to make, then it, it wouldn't be the game that it is, obviously, and it perhaps wouldn't be talked about in the same way either. So, No, that's absolutely true. I mean, just to do a, a quick breakdown, if you uh, if you took the 700 and then said, you know, maybe 200 of that never went to us because of all mm -hmm. those other transactions, mm -hmm. and then another 100 went to uh, uh, fulfilling prizes, um, and you're left with maybe 300, you know, if each of us working on the game and a fourth contractor just paid ourselves a salary of mm. like 70k which is pretty normal in the industry that would give us one year of development time so that seven like that amazing seven hundred thousand dollars turns into one year for a couple people mm. and that's mm. you know as most people know you don't make a game in one year uh, mm. yes. so it's amazing how quickly it gets uh uh, you yeah. know, shredded down. And and your ambition grows, and, and that's how something like Double Fine that we mentioned earlier, that's how Double Fine ran out of money, despite yeah. raising so, so much more than they originally mm -hmm. asked for. And, you know, I watched through their documentary, and it's a fascinating process, and it's none of it really was, you know, it's not down to mismanagement or just being frivolous with it. It's not down to, oh, we've made a load of money, so let's go and buy Ferraris and do whatever. It's just... The I guess your ideas and the scope of the game grow with 
with those boundaries being expanded and then yeah all of a sudden you're in a situation where like you say perhaps either you're running out of money um as happened with double fine or or like you mentioned there's a huge amount of crunch to get the game done there's you're working ungodly hours and and um yeah and it's a difficult thing i mean all that said on the flip side of it the more positive notion was okay so there wasn't this limitless amount of money the, but the community that sprung up around it like you mentioned earlier the community spirit that sprung up around it the way the game was talked about and has continued to be talked about was was but invaluable <laughs> and, it, and it's what it's done for you guys as as a company and for your for your names if not your bank balances is a has been an incredible thing and and that is down to you know the amount that of of money yes but work and time and love and effort that you put into it mm-hmm. has kind of been reflected in in what was produced and also the way that people have reacted to it i think so it's you know that side of things is um is a whole other story that's a that's a kind of a hugely positive side yeah. Welcome to the Indie by Design podcast halftime show, in which I'm hoping not to suffer any embarrassing wardrobe malfunctions. If you're interested in gaining more insight into game design and game designers, be sure to check out our website, indiebydesign.net, where you'll find more episodes of the Indie by Design podcast and our book available for purchase and lots more besides. If you have suggestions, questions or feedback on the podcast, you can tweet us at Indie by Design or get in touch via facebook.com slash Indie by Design. If you like what we're doing and have time to leave us a short review on your podcast platform of choice, that would be very much appreciated. You can also check out what we're doing over at patreon.com slash indie by design and directly help to make the podcast better, as well as bag some additional patron-only content. On to the second part of our discussion with Alex Thomas now, and we begin with Alex explaining how Killers and Thieves started life as a smaller project aimed at helping him to get back into the game development mindset, and how it quickly grew to be something far more detailed and ambitious. This was just going to be a, an in-betweener mm-hmm. kind of project, just to just to get back in the swing of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and the idea was really simple. Like you were a, a fence in the thieves guild, and people would bring you items, and then you would inspect these three D items and look for different parts of it, uh, which mm-hmm. would increase the value. Um, so if you found like an inscription, you, you know, it oh, would. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and it, that's really all it was. It was like, you know, around the time when games like Papers, Please would mm-hmm. come out and they had a very focused, singular uh, mechanic that it would then expand on as you played the game. And then it, it evolved from there uh, into something bigger and then into something else that was bigger and then into something else that was bigger until it got to the point where it was just, it was like an insanely ambitious game for one person. Uh, which is, I guess, the story of every game. I was, was going to say, you would think you would learn, right? You would think, you would think they did the Banner Saga, come on. You would think, but no. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think what happens is it's not just the developer sitting there going like, I'm, I want to do everything in the world. Mm. You're sitting there and you're looking at your product and you're going like, is this enough for people to care about? You know, yeah. um, and you keep uh, refining it and improving it until you see something that you think an audience is going to latch on to and, and have enough to to really want to play or to tell other people about. Yeah, well, yes, and that's certainly a key thing, absolutely. It started uh, with what sounds like, I don't know if you guys have it in the States, but we have a, it's a quintessentially British show, as to my mind at least, but it's a show called Antiques Roadshow, which is basically uh-huh. about uh, Joe Public rocking up to a venue where there are antiques experts and they hand them this thing that they found in their in their basement or in their loft or in their in their attic and they say oh i've had this in the family for 20 years and you know here's this thing and here's the story behind it and the expert takes it and looks it over and looks for kind of these telltale marks like you're like you were talking about like a watermark or a yeah. a craft a, you know a crafter's mark and says oh okay and then at the end of it they give them a valuation and and that's always the bit that people uh, are on tenterhooks for exactly. like, it's going to be and worth you know loads of money. It sounds like it started from that sort of perspective. Is that well, was that was that the whole game basically? In fact, while while uh, while I was taking a break before I started working on it, I I had been watch binge watched like five seasons of Pawn Stars. Okay, <laughs> which is basically a yeah, trash, yeah. trashy American version <laughs> of the Antiques Roadshow, uh, and it's all staged and it's a stupid show, but. 
but you still <laughs> watch it because you someone brings in some mm. weird thing they dug out of their grandma's yard and you're like, Ooh, I wonder <laughs> if it's worth ten thousand dollars. That was yeah, that was absolutely like you know, it would it would be fun to be the guy on the other side of the counter mm. valuing these items that somebody stole and brought to him. But <laughs> But yeah, it didn't. Yeah. It didn't end up anything like that concept. Um, you know that it that concept transformed into okay. Now, what if you had some influence over the thieves that were stealing this stuff? So now you're doing mm. both of these systems, and you would just send thieves out, and they would come back, and they'd have stuff. Um, so it was a little bit more management. And then as I'm working on that, I'm going. You know, people. Uh, I think players would want to actually be personally involved in stealing the thing. So now you've got characters in the side scrolling view and they're, you know, you control them and you're controlling multiple thieves and they're stealing stuff and they bring it back. And then I'm realizing like, well, the, the part where you evaluate stuff now is going to be re repetitive and, and mm -hmm. the player is going to get tired of it quickly. So I'm like, okay, we're going to scrap that part. And, th and now I've got a completely different game. Um, at this point, you've invested resources and time, and you're no longer even sure if this is something that anybody wants, you know. <laughs> uh, but you've become wildly ambitious because you, you're looking at your project as it develops and going, okay, is this something that's going to really hook people? Um, are they going to – what a driving motivator is – what are they going to complain about with this? <laughs> like, oh, I like this, but I wish it had, you know – Bro force combat, <laughs> uh, destructible environment. So you're like, okay, well, it, you can really get lost in the weeds easily. Mm. Well, I mean, I, one of the th I've been playing it quite a lot over this this past week, and one of the things that I do really like about it is the there's a feeling, and I've been trying to f trying to understand it myself, trying to understand what it is. I kind of I know how it makes me feel. I just yeah. don't know if I if I know how to um, if I know how to vocalize it. And there's kind of a feeling of intimacy that I get when I would play in this game. It's it's a and I think it's it is similar to to what I felt when I played the original Banner Saga. I think like it feels like I am part of this world. Um, and I guess I guess that a lot of that has got to do with the writing i believe i think that's kind of where a lot of that comes from but it's mm -hmm. there's also a um what i've or at least what i perceive to be a relationship between uh kind of the how i play killers and thieves and how i feel about it and by that i mean like i, I play it on my pc sat in a big comfy chair kind of at a, a desk and there's this sort of even just this kind of close, the close proximity of everything. That mm -hmm. I am closer to the screen than I am when I sit on the sofa and play a console game. And I, I wonder if is there ever any kind of, I'm not sure what, <laughs> what even what that's called, but the, the kind of uh, uh, like the t tactility, if that's a word, yeah. the kind of tactility of of the experience. Does that? Does that ever come up? Like, is that something you are able to create through design, or is that kind of a almost a byproduct of it? Is that sort of just a something that happens to some people and not others? Like, or is that like? I guess probably my my first question is: Do you even kind of understand what I mean when I'm yeah. like when I'm explaining right. that? Does that does that make sense even? I do. I do think I understand what you're saying because we we I did intentionally go for a lot of what you're talking about. Uh, and a lot of the revisions that I kept coming back to do uh, was because of that. So, mm -hmm. you know, everything, uh, all the information is passed to the player on little slips of paper in the game. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. a very, like, you know, uh, like a Thieves Guild thing, and then they would mm -hmm. burn mm -hmm. it. Or, or you know, for markers, uh, all everything is a coin. And... It, um, and uh, the game originally had no story. It was it was like a roguelike back when roguelikes mm -hmm. were popular. And then as they became less popular during development, I'm I'm going like, oh no, I need a 
I need something to pull the player through the game and not just a constant repetition of doing heists. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I added a, a big story, actually, um, that most people will never see the majority of. And, uh, and then that had to be presented. Um, and you think about things like... Um, you can't just throw a giant wall of text at the player because they'll mm -hmm. just click through it. Um, so we put it on a narrow uh, piece of paper so that uh, they only see a smaller part and then they have to click through it to get more text so that they don't mm -hmm. know exactly how much text there's going to be so they're more willing to keep going. Yeah. And, and then, then digest it in bite-sized pieces. Yeah, but it also, again, feels more like little snippets being, mm. you know, like mm. a, like a theme uh, in a thieves guild, and that's all intentional to mm. to try to mm. to uh, to make it all um, feel like this cohesive world, like you said. And then, uh, you know, I have like a personal obsession with maps. Um, mm. Mm. I like working on maps and and reading them um, and drawing them, and a lot of the game is based on maps. So, uh, you know, I want the places to feel real when you look at uh, the, you know, I can't, as a single developer, I can't develop an entire actual world for you to run around in, mm. uh, but I want the maps to feel authentic. So I, I, I think, I mean, if that's the impression that you're getting from it, then great. Like, mm. uh, the interesting thing is, there's so many games out right now. I'm sure people have talked about this a lot. Um, and you have to get people's attention immediately or they bounce mm. off of it. You know, the, a lot of players are unwilling to invest any time in, in a game now, whereas when you were a kid and you only had, like, two games, <laughs> you're like, well, I'm going to play one of those and mm. I'll figure it out. Uh, so the people who have invested time into Killers and... and Kind of figured it out and gotten deeper into it than the uh, than the point two hours that I see most reviews have. Mm -hmm. uh, the feedback that I get, which has been, I think, uh, obfuscating what what the general public feels, is that they really like it because um, you know some people have even told me like they they were obsessed with playing this game for a while, mm -hmm. and and they got really into it. Um, and then when you find people bouncing off of it so hard, it's such a, like, uh, coming out of left field, like, I had no idea there was going to be this kind of huge uh, reaction to it, contrary to what everyone else was telling me. Mm. So, I mean, I know you've talked or, or written in the past about early access and foregoing early access, and I wonder, um, with early access and with Kickstarter as well, both of those things creates a hopefully creates a buzz creates a a word of mouth thing there's this, this that kind of idea of people finding stumbling across something in early access or even just the kickstarter page and then saying to somebody else oh i found this really cool thing and it's that's all kind of part of the experience of being able to follow along um as something is developed and eventually released. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side of that is you have something like Killers and Thieves and something that I've heard from from kind of friends or have who work in the industry is how refreshing it is to have something that... Um, I mean, I wouldn't say it, it's, it hasn't come out of left field. We've known as an as a industry, you know, people have known that you've been working on on this game in one shape or another for you know, a good couple of years now. It was definitely, like it, was uh, just, it was definitely a stealth launch. Yeah, and it was, and but I, and people, the people that I've spoken to liked that, and they said, oh, it's you know, it's refreshing not to have this really long tail of, of preview events and and this that and the other, um, or just constantly getting emails about, oh, check out the latest build, check out the latest build, and it did just kind of, all right, okay, now it's out, now it's released, but I wonder, just looping that back round to the early access and the Kickstarter stuff, do you feel? you know, your appraisal of it, has that hurt it in any way? Do you think you would have received, would there have been a bigger buzz had it been something that was, maybe not Kickstarter, because I don't know how appropriate that would have been for, right. for this sort of project, but but certainly early access. Do you, I guess the, the question is, do you 
do you kind of feel that you were justified? Do you stand by kind of your feeling on early access and, and it not being right for Killers and Thieves? Or, or do you think it would have benefited from going through that process? Well, I have kind of an interesting story about that. Um, the uh, the big update that I said where I was skipping early access, uh, mm-hmm. not coincidentally, uh, happened during the same time that Darkest Dungeon was going through such growing pains mm-hmm, that they mm-hmm. were getting news articles just based on how yeah. how hard it was uh, working between their vision and their and their uh, players what they wanted. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, we you know I think the industry probably everyone talks to everyone. Uh, the Stoic guys have talked to them and about how hard it was and what a nightmare it was. Um, and you know they they've almost practically said we will never do that again. It was mm-hmm. so hard mm-hmm. and 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 such a bad experience that they'll never do it again. Mm-hmm. Even though it was the thing that <laughs> made their their game such a huge hit, like almost a genre defining hit, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, <clears throat> and it's interesting to hear that behind the scenes it was this bloodbath and they and they were hating it mm. um and i didn't want to do that you know that was exactly what i i had gotten uh sick over um mm-hmm. previously yeah. Yeah. and i wasn't willing to to uh go back into that cycle um especially as a one man team mm. um but having said that um, if I do another game, if I'm able to do another game, I'm, I'll probably end up going the complete opposite direction. I'll do a Kickstarter, I'll do early access, I'll uh, present the game as just an ongoing production and not, mm-hmm. and not a uh, something that you wrap up and ship out and you're done. Uh, mm-hmm. Because since starting work on Killers, the sentiment on that has completely done a 180 in the public. That is now gone from people complaining about how annoying it is that every game is early access to if you're not doing early access, then your game must be kind of crap. Like, Mm. why aren't you showing it? Why aren't you letting me play it? Um, Mm. People now like the idea that they can stop playing a game come back a couple of months later and there's all these new features. Um, mm. and, and even while they're playing a game, they like the idea that somebody is there, you know, working on it and listening to their opinion about what needs to happen mm. to it. Mm. Um, and that is a complete flip from public opinion when I started on Killers. Um, so, you know, by the time I finish another game, who knows, maybe they'll be back to hating it. <laughs> uh, but I think that's that's currently how it is and how, how people want their games developed. And I kind of get it. I kind of see the appeal in that. Um, mm. Doing a stealth launch is an absolute mistake, in my opinion. So anybody out there listening like, hey, I wonder what he, you know, <laughs> not many people do this. I wonder how it went for him. I'm like, uh, you know, I'm not the Beyonce of video games. I can't put out... <laughs> a product without talking about it and then expect it to do well on its own merits, you know? Um, Mm, mm. Because what ended up happening was the ultimate goal was with a stealth launch, when I announce it, people are going to be interested and at least post something. At least Mm. the news blogs will be like, hey, this game came out. Isn't that cool? Like, you can buy it right now. Mm, Um, Yeah. And with how hard it is to get marketing, that was my marketing plan, you know. Uh, even though I had uh, people helping with advertising and, and getting promotion, the plan was, like, here's the announcement. It's actually out. And then that would draw people in. Mm. Uh, almost the exact opposite happened. Like, we started sending out uh, pre-release copies and telling people it was going to launch on this date. And I think people were just absolutely confused. They were like, well, if I haven't heard about this game, then it must be pretty, pretty crap, you know? Yeah. 
um, because we're so used to like you should have been talking about it for two years. I mean, how good could it be if you if you didn't? And there's this idea like with um, Bethesda not sending out review copies that really <laughs> pissed people yeah. off. It pissed off the news outlets mm-hmm. because. Um, mm-hmm. And the, the angle they went with it is, what is Bethesda trying to hide, you know? Yeah. And like, well, I, I understand where they're coming from, Bethesda, with not wanting to do this whole, um, you know, horse and pony show. Mm. Or is it mm. dog and pony? <laughs> <It> doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, A show of any description. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but that uh, is another thing that has completely changed since I started working on Killers. There is this large sentiment that um, people, like, just do the right thing and make a game and finish it and release it. How come nobody can do that anymore? Mm. You know? Mm. And and that is not the case anymore because if you don't do how it currently is, you look kind of weird. Like, you, you don't know what you're doing mm. or you're trying to hide something. Yeah. And I, I wonder how much of... I wonder how much of it is just kind of... the. A template or a formulaic. Uh, people are used to things working in a certain way, and mm-hmm. so, like you say, so you get an email with a code that says this game's out right now, and if people don't recognise the name of it, or they don't, or that there isn't enough in that immediate, you know, the first two lines of that email, then they're not even going to bother installing that game to find out what it's like because they're used to just being, they're used to. They're used to the hype, like you say. They're used yeah. to kind of the the, the 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 show, be it dog and pony or horse and pony, or <laughs> whoever, a donkey and pony, whatever. Right. One thing that was very surprising to me was I have a relationship with some of the guys at Rock Paper Shotgun. Mm-hmm. We've mm-hmm. we've personally talked to them quite a few times, especially with like the King dot com thing that happened to Banner <laughs> yeah. Saga, and yeah. uh, and they're a PC only site, and I thought for sure like. We're, we can get an article on RPS, right? Like, just a mention that the game came out, and yeah. nothing, like crickets from them. And, uh, yeah. you know, the same day that my game came out, uh, their top article was something about, like, the best cats in video games or something. And, and like, really, you couldn't even mention this? And I don't know at all what happened there. Um mm. And and why they just had absolutely no interest in mentioning this game, um, because you know I, I would have thought like, hey, the the founder of Stoic who made the Banner Saga made a new mm, game. Mm. You would think that would get some interest. Yeah. But just like I think intro, Introversion found out with their like mega hit Prison Architect that sold two million copies, and then they made a game that I didn't even know exists, even though I followed yeah. them. Uh, yeah. called Scanner Sombre. Sombre? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Scan- Scanner Sombre, yeah. Sombre. I played that recently, yeah. Uh, and and them too, just sitting there going like, wow, we just made a total bomb. Um, mm. you, you'd think our pedigree would have counted for something, but absolutely not. Didn't count for mm. anything. Yeah, yeah. Chris Chris Delay, one of the introversion guys, talked about that that exact thing, you're right. He, he said, like, he, he... And he wasn't being... Um, Big headed about it, he wasn't. He was just kind of stating what he saw as the facts. That yeah. he said that he didn't even think that was possible for them to have a launch post Prison Architect. He didn't think it was possible to have a launch like Scanner Sombre received. Uh, not in terms of like review scores or anything else, just in terms of the general interest yeah, yeah. or or disinterest. Um, yeah, so it is. It's a curious thing. I mean, I don't know. Like, like is what's your read of that is is there i think what every indie developer is, is doing right now is like sitting there looking at all the data we now have and going like why is this happening you know mm. and mm. i don't think anybody has the correct answer because it moves so quickly the industry changes so quickly um some people are going to say the market is flooded which is probably true um, some people are going to say, like, well, of course Scanner Sombra didn't do well. Look at it, you know. Who wants mm. to play that? Or with my game, like, oh, okay, you made an incredibly niche uh, game that is too complicated for most people. What did you expect? You know, and it's it's all speculation. Nobody Nobody really knows. If people knew, 
uh, the big publishers would be doing a lot better than they are, but they're confused mm. as hell too. When you have a game like Dishonored 2 come out and barely sell a hundred thousand copies in the first couple of weeks, mm. you're scratching your head. Like, but the first one sold millions. So, yeah. I mean, what do you people want? You know? Yeah. Um, it's a yeah. It's a crazy. I think Devolver Digital, who you know, an indie publisher, they published a lot of. Uh, a lot of recognisable um, indie games, you know, people that perhaps play just games as a casual thing will, will recognise some of the games that they've put out. But they, mm-hmm. they've spoken to us and kind of said the same sort of thing, that you can see, you can have this incredible success with one game and you can look at all the data that's available mm-hmm. and it almost, it just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. No. You certainly can't take that data and then try and replicate what you've done with it somewhere else, because it just does not translate. And it's just this, re- you know, by all accounts, one particular game they put out that's very successful, they might look at that and think, well, you know, we have modest expectations for this game, and it just goes through the roof. Yeah, and then like rain or something. Game, yeah, yeah. And another game they think, oh, this should do okay, and then it just, you know, it's like, like you say, crickets, you can be heard in the background when it gets pushed out the door. So it's, yeah, it's uh, it's a bizarre... A bizarre thing. Now, the, the dangerous thing about it is a big publisher is going to look at this, and they're they're playing mm. for, for keeps, mm. you know? They're not messing mm. around. Um, mm. And they're going to become more and more conservative in mm. the games that they agree to fund. Uh, because if there's no predictability, then all you have to go on is we need to make a return on our money and we need to do it in the safest way possible. And it's just going to be, you know, it's just going to be Call of Duty forever. Um, mm. That's probably what the next game is called. Call of Duty <laughs> Forever is probably what the next one is going to be. That's a good point. Uh, but but game uh, publishers who, have, who actively take a risk, like when Ubisoft would make something like Child of Light, mm. they mm. would then get punished for it because it didn't make a profit, you know? And mm. you can't, like, lay it all at the consumer's feet, like, oh, gamers, they have such poor taste. They're not buying every one of these 200 games that come out <laughs> each day. Um, and it's absolutely not their fault. There is oversaturation. And there's also a huge segment of gamers who are, like, oversaturation deniers for some reason. Mm. Like this mm. vocal... Uh, group of people who who are quick to tell you there's no problem with the number of games coming out. You just need to make games that aren't garbage. As <laughs> if any one of us are sitting down and going like, well, let me make something that sucks. Yeah. But the, uh, the, the period for doing niche products and experimental games and games that don't look like mass appeal and big production, uh, mm-hmm. big budget production, I think those times might be... Might be reaching a, a, a really rough patch, um, mm. at least until maybe some companies start to shutter and there's just less competition. Yeah. And the, the real question is, is it going to level out or is it going to get worse and worse until there's a, just a crash? Mm. And I don't think anybody knows. How does it feel kind of being amongst all of that and then going going back? And I don't know what stage Banner Saga 3 is at in terms of your, your contribution, your writing. Is it does that um, does the sort of creative um, environment that you are in, in terms of this sort of industry wide uh, turmoil or um, disquiet, is kind of that you're going through at the moment? Does that how does that translate when you sit down to, to work on something like Banner Saga Three? That you like you said you wanted to kind of write that one before. Mm-hmm. Uh, any of the others That's, you could I guess you could have done a George Lucas and just really <laughs> a really weird order and right. started with the third one but but does that kind of does that affect consciously at least does that affect the way that you approach the writing does does that you know hearing about things that have happened with other games hearing about and I'm going to have to go to that the, the whole Mass Effect 3 mm-hmm. thing you know and how the, the, how that was uh, received does that play a part that you're aware of in your creative process when you you kind of sit down and, and the risks that you're willing to take or the the directions that you're willing to push the story or heaven forbid not tying everything up with a bow you know right. does that kind of affect how you approach 
as a writer, does that affect how you approach yeah. something like Banner Saga 3 or, or anything else? I, I, uh, I get what you're saying, um, and I'd have to make the distinction that if this was a new project, it, it would absolutely affect every aspect of it. Banner Saga is uh, currently existing in this nice little bubble of people who are really into the Banner Saga mm-hmm. and, and want us to do the Banner Saga and not change course. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're, we're absolutely delivering on what the Banner Saga is um, without worrying about what the rest of the industry is doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and to that, uh, uh, I, I can absolutely say that we're super, super happy with the story in the Banner Saga 3 and how it wraps up. And, uh, we, you know, we've taken into consideration exactly the example you gave. <laughs> uh, and I think we've absolutely nailed it. So I'm, I'm very happy about that. And, uh, mm-hmm. right now it's just a matter of, you know, making it, uh, mm-hmm. finishing it. Uh, as high quality as possible. Um, but if if we weren't in this situation where we know our audience and we know there is an audience, um, I don't, I can't confidently say what the right thing to do would be right now, mm. what the right game it would be to make. Mm. Um, okay, so let's just, uh, I guess, as, as a final final two things um the first of which is uh just following on from from that point really that i guess that there is a there is a a middle ground between what we saw the reaction to uh to mass effect 3 Mm -hmm. and also going going to something like um lord of the rings the the film trilogy that kind of the film ends and then there's about 20 minutes of of tying up every single character story, right. so it feels. I mean, I'm probably exaggerating there, but um, so I, think so it, I guess yeah. there's. I think it was close to 20 minutes. <laughs> it felt like it. I mean, I, you know, I'm not a huge fan of of very long films, but that yeah, there there was certainly a lot at the end of that. But th- there's a there's a happy medium to be had in terms of as much as you're willing to to kind of talk about at the moment. But is there? Have you experimented with ways of? tying up story that perhaps kind of that it happens throughout the third installment of Banner Saga rather than all at the end if that makes sense like yeah. is there a kind of a like a, an experimentation with pacing rather than it all ending when people expect it to end and not before and not after like have you right. kind of experimented with that in any way well pacing is our biggest advantage in the Banner Saga because this was not intentional. We just kind of lucked out that we made something where we could control the pacing very precisely. Mm-hmm. We know how long combats take people, uh, and the the story plays out linearly. You don't have an overworld to run around in like you do in a lot mm-hmm. of RPGs that you could just mm-hmm. go off and completely miss the storyline. Um, mm-hmm. And in a lot of ways, people have mentioned how it's almost like a graphic novel, uh, which... You know, it still feels more like an RPG to me, but like I say, we can absolutely control the pacing, and we're super uh, focused on making sure that it's good. Mm-hmm. Um, because even even someone who's highly invested in the game, uh, <laughs> uh, I want to put this delicately, will still get bored if we do it wrong. <laughs> mm-hmm. With all the reading. Um, and Pretty much from the start to the finish of Banner Saga is that process of doling out the ending as it happens. So I feel like the end of Saga 2 was kind of this Mm. peak in the storyline, and now we're going straight towards the ending, and everything as we we pace it out is in, uh, uh, you know, working towards that. Um, Mm. So the nice thing is we don't have to worry about a uh, crossover into another sequel, and we're just mm-hmm. able to kill people off left and right. <laughs> uh, you guys were doing that already. <laughs> oh, you thought we were, but but now we definitely. Yeah, that's the end. Everybody's dead. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, we always like one of our one of our key des- design features was that nobody has plot immunity. 
You know, mm-hmm. Nobody's safe. Mm-hmm. It's like Game of Thrones, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. we wanted to deliver on that, not in that every person will die, but every person can die, mm-hmm. depending on what the player does. Um, mm-hmm. And that's absolutely truer than ever in the Saga 3. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the, the finale that you end up with could be absolutely and utterly different, uh, not just in the actual story, but in who you have compared to somebody else. Mm. That's, see, see I, have you guys struggled, though, with the thing that I think Game of Thrones has, particularly with the, uh, the introduction of the TV show, that although it, it certainly for a long time in Game of Thrones felt like any, you know, anybody could die. When, when uh, poor Ned Stark died and, and nobody, the people that hadn't read the books were like, oh my God, if, if Sean Bean can die. Yeah. Kind of forgetting that Sean Bean always Well, died. yeah. If Sean Bean can die, then, you know, anybody can. But it feels like over time, again, particularly for the TV show, certain characters have become immune to that. So, and this is kind of detached from the book because obviously it is following what's going on in the books to a to a large extent. But sure. It feels like people like Tyrion and people like Arya. Oh, spoilers. If, if, oh, yeah. I <laughs> just preface this by saying big spoilers, people. Uh, they get together. No, they don't get together. Um, that they, like, that, that now it's at a stage where they, those characters couldn't die. They'd just be too much outrage. There'd be too much old people who'd just say, I'm just not watching this anymore. That's ridiculous. Right. Have you guys experienced that kind of attachment to characters, that kind of you know, has that in any way changed plans as to what could or couldn't happen with certain characters that you've seen people become so attached to it that you just kind of veer away from making some of those messier decisions? Well, the the truth is that uh, a big series like Game of Thrones or Harry Potter are sometimes a victim of their own success because, mm-hmm. like you say, a, a character like Tyrion is so popular that now I'm sure, you know, Martin is, is going, well... <laughs> do I even have the right to kill this guy anymore? You know, he's like, he's like a public entity. Um, yeah. Whereas we're, we're still an indie game with an indie audience. And the night, the nice thing about that is we've always had the leeway to take risks. So I can, mm-hmm. I can categorically tell you that there is no safe character in the Banner Saga. None. Okay. <laughs> and you can read into that however you want, you know? Okay. Awesome. Alex, um, I think we will end it there. Thank you very much for your time. And again, thank you for uh, persevering through my um, my rain checks and postponements. Oh, yeah. Um, no problem at all. I appreciate that. Uh, as I say, we'll, we, the episodes that we do go up on a Wednesday, I think we'll probably be looking at doing this next Wednesday or the week after. Uh, but I'll, I'll let you know and... Um, and yeah, thanks very much for your time, and good luck with. I hope I hope the I hope the that Killers and Thieves has a has a long tail, and I don't know word of mouth takes off or something kind of kickstarts that, and people it's just a slow burn or whatever it may be. Yeah, but, I can and you know, you know I can I can. The the silver lining is it it broke even. It had such a low overhead on purpose that mm. it was almost mm. impossible to to you know lose money on it. It broke even, and it's never going to pay back the opportunity cost of working mm-hmm. on it for two and a half years mm-hmm. uh, when I could have done something else. But, um, you know, it didn't put me in debt, so that's about the most I can ask for. <laughs> yeah, and it's, well, I guess like we would said way back a while ago, uh, just different different metrics of success i guess it's it's not yeah. not every game has to be an overnight millionaire maker it can just be that it it can just be that it gets you from one game to the next it can be that it means you stretch your creative muscles it can be that like you say it doesn't put you into debt yeah so, i was hoping to, yeah. to like maybe pay off the house or something that would have been nice mm. but no <laughs> such luck ironic because it's you know it's a game about thieves <laughs> and you would think that there'd be more money in it but hey there we go For more on games and game creators, visit IndieByDesign.net. Follow Indie by Design on Twitter, Facebook and on YouTube by searching Indie by Design, where you'll also find game walkthroughs, design deep dives and much more.
Do also consider nipping over to patreon.com slash indiebydesign to see what we have going over there and to bag yourself some additional podcast content as well as get the warm, fuzzy glow of helping us to make this podcast even better. Indie by Design podcast episodes are released every Wednesday and we hope to have you back here next week. The music used in this episode is owned and provided by Ben Prunty. Thank you.